Lord, we come to you today, warts and all, praying, Lord, that you would reveal to us a new insight into your ever-abiding faith and hope and mercy and love in us, your children. And we're living in times, Lord, right now when we need to be reminded of your love your never-failing love, your ever-abiding love for each and every one of us, especially as we walk through the paths we're on. So give us your Holy Spirit right now. Give us ears to hear what you would say through me. Jesus, we give you honor, glory, and praise. Always, always, it's all for you. In your name, amen. Have a seat. I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank my IT man, Zach. That was the best little April Fool's gift I have been given in a long time. Gee whiz. When I say I should be careful what I say in the pulpit, you know what's coming next. So I have a little song here. I mean, it is the Grammys tonight, in case you care. Boy, how about those Oscars? Can I just say, uh, much respect to my brother from another mother, Chris Rock. We live in a world where there's so much retaliation and there's so much quick hate when someone does something that you don't like. And I'm sorry, I'm old enough, and now this is going to be in the bloopers. My grandmother told me, you just walk away. Do we still teach that to our children and our grandchildren? I, bet, I hope we do, because someone taught it to Chris Rock. He turned the other cheek. It's a good brother. It's amazing how that little event there last Sunday night has dominated the discourse all week when there's a few other things going on in the world that are downright nasty and evil and desire and deserve all our attention and prayer and supplication. But tonight's the Grammys. Not saying I'm going to watch them, but so in the interest of music, uh, my sermon is about Jesus being... The ultimate friend. Oh, oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble everywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I'm not Aretha Franklin, and she's saying that for my money, you want to pick me up this week? You just Google Aretha Franklin. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. That'll take you out of the darkness and into the light like that. Why do I want to talk about Jesus and his friendship? A lot of preachers don't talk about it. It gets a little, it gets a little borderline uncomfortable, right? Some of you like your Jesus up there, all high and mighty, up on that pedestal, sitting there on his golden throne. I'm not going to do, you know, Ricky Bobby and Talladega Nights because you might think that's irreverent, but that's one of the finest little references to Jesus in any Hollywood movie I've ever seen. And if you're confused what I'm talking about, you just need to go... You know exactly. That's why you're here. My Jesus, however, is not up on that throne and uh, seated in his kingly glory. I remember as a boy growing up, the church I grew up in, the church in the Nativity in Newport, Pennsylvania, had a cross above the high altar and had Jesus in royal regalia, all in these vestments, Christus Rex, Christ the King. For my money, and some of you know this, but she's not here because she sings in shepherd song, my most go-to line of scripture in, my in the entire Bible is in the 15th chapter of John. Remember, he's, having, he's breaking bread with them. It's the Last Supper. And he says, abide in me and I in you, because without me you can do nothing. It's a great farewell discourse. And in that tender discourse, remember what Jesus says to them? He says to his disciples, I don't call you servants anymore. I call you my friends. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that that's my Jesus right there. 
He is first and foremost my friend. I believe Diana Butler Bass is smarter than me. She has a whole chapter devoted to reclaiming and freeing Jesus and bringing back Jesus as friend. But the church does a good job of trying to beat that out of you. Because if Jesus is your friend, then why do you need the church? Think about that. Think about that. If he's your friend, then why do you need the church? I'll get to that in a second. But the tender-hearted intimacy, and that's another word I want to plant deep today. Intimacy, friends, is not something that we see very much of. At least I don't. Now, there's pseudo-intimacy. There's a thing called, oh, I'm picking on it, Facebook friends. That is a slippery slope. I stand before you as someone who only can, and probably all of us can, do this. And if you have more than one, you're really blessed. Like one or two really close friends. Like in the dark night of the soul, I got like two buddies, and that's okay. I don't need more than one because my best friend is Jesus. Oh, I love him, and he's never let me down. Friends will let me down. Spouses will let me down. Parishioners will let me down. Colleagues, bishops, the guy making my coffee. I don't drink coffee at the shops. You know that by now. I make my own, but Jesus never lets me down. So I have a couple friends. If you have a couple friends, you are richly blessed in this life. And that's radically different from having a thousand Facebook friends. But don't, don't get me wrong. Facebook can be and is used. Heck, we're using technology right now to spread the word. But if you're looking for a friend, I'm here to submit to you this morning that this beautiful gospel is as intimate and as tender a gospel as you will find. And I'm so glad it has come up the week before Palm Sunday because we really need, I really need to be reminded of Jesus as my friend. So what the scene is right now is coming out of chapter 11, and that's a heck of a scene right there. I'm going to step out for a second. Chapter 11. Are we hot? We're hot. Picture the scene. Close your eyes. Please. Jesus is in a neighboring town. He gets word that his friend has died. Lazarus. Mind you, and focus on when I say his friend has died. Right away, right away, that should kick up in all of us the memory of friends of ours, dear friends who have died, who, who, who have, we see no more. And I want you to get in touch with that emotion because it's a very, very powerful emotion. And in the life of this community lately, we've had people who we call friends go on to their larger reward in heaven. They have died and we don't see them anymore. But their love lives on and their memories of the connection that we have, the intimacy we have with our friends, it's very, very powerful. And Jesus hears his friend has died. And what does he say? He says, I'm not ready to go and see him. His disciples say, well, come on now. He's, he, he, we hear he's sleeping. He's, and he said, Jesus says, no, he's not sleeping. He has died. Well, then well, let's go, Thomas says. Let us go with you. And he says, not yet until my heavenly father is glorified. So three days have passed and he makes his way to Bethany. Jesus walking in the town, walking in the town. And what happens? The sister of the dead man, Lazarus, his friend, comes running out to him. And she says to him, Lord, where have you been? You feel that intimacy. You feel that connection. That's friends talking to friends. There's no like Christus Rex going on here. She says, where were you? 
in the vernacular, we would say, where was your sorry? You know what I'm saying. And he gets down on her level and he says, look at me, sister. Who are you talking to? Don't you know who you're talking to? Oh, I know he'll be fine. And on the last day, he'll rise up again on the resurrection on the last day. He looks her in the eye. And he says, Martha, you're talking to the resurrection. She puts her head down. She says, oh my, you're right. I know I am. I know you're the Messiah. I know you're the son of God. Mary, John 11, chapter 11, refers to Mary, Martha's sister, as the one who anoints him with the expensive oil and lets down her hair and wipes it off with her hair. Right then and there is like three major faux pas that a woman, a single woman would, would never touch in that day and time. That is one, let down her hair, not, not kosher. Two, be seen as a single woman with a single man pouring ointment on him and rubbing his feet. Rubbing his feet is symbolic. And this is what I want to get at. Because it's a, there's beautiful portent. There's beautiful foreshadowing in chapter 12. This little story, this little intimate story that the, that the beloved disciple, the one who we believe wrote the fourth gospel, that he included before Jesus goes into Jerusalem in a triumphant way, he stops and has dinner, he has supper, he, ha he breaks bread with his friends, and his friend, who happens to be a single gal, gets on her knees, takes down her hair, and dumps out all of this expensive oil all over his feet, which you anoint only the feet of someone who's dead. See, you anoint heads in the Bible. You anoint feet when the person's dead. And then Judas cops an attitude and says, what about all that expensive oil? We could have spent that on the poor. But he's also, between his words, going, look at that gal. Look at what she's doing, making a fool of herself. And Jesus says, I love these words. This is, this, is, this is for every one of us who on a daily basis has people telling us what to do, how to do it. You just say and hear Jesus say, leave him alone. Don't even go there. If Will Smith could have reeled back the last seven days, he would have heard Jesus say to him, just leave him alone. It's not going to do you any good to get up out of your chair. Just leave him alone. Just give him to me. Jesus says, leave her alone. And in that place, something incredible happens. We see, we feel and we partake in the most intimate interchange in the Bible between Jesus and people who the Bible names as his friends, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Of course, Lazarus has already then been brought out of the tomb, and he's with them at dinner, and now the, the Pharisees are plotting to kill him. But I want you to feel, and I want you to just take in deeply the intimacy that Jesus has for each and every one of us. Especially, especially in the times we live in. He is with us. He has never forsaken us. And the metaphor for me of pouring out all this expensive nard, all this ointment, all this oil, very expensive. The metaphor there or the analogy for me is that that's analogous to the abundant and extravagant and lavish and overflowing love that Jesus has for each and every one of us. I want people to know something. The only, the only reason I'm standing here right now is because I thought I knew the intimacy and the love that Jesus had for me 
for basically the first 30 odd years of my life. I'm here to testify to you who are listening and to the folk here in this church this morning that that is just a small tip of the iceberg of a love that is so deep and so wide. And that love holds me and holds you and all of us, all of us, even those who don't even know him to the end of the ages. As we all enter into the most holy week of the entire year, holy week starts next Sunday. Go and find those things Go and talk to those friends who know and love Jesus. Be around them. Go to our website. Listen to the teachings that we just had put up from the recent conference. Listen to how God's love for you. I don't care what age you are. I don't care where your background is or where you're from. Know and experience the depths and the profound grace that God has in store for you. We don't have to wait until we get to heaven to experience that love. We can get it and have it right here in this earthly pilgrimage of ours. Let me say a prayer. Lord, oh, what a friend we have in you. You are so tender-hearted and so loving, even when we sometimes don't get it right. But you forgive and you help us to keep on with what you have put before us. We could not do it without you. And some of us especially are needing that more than others. And I pray an extra special blessing upon those who, maybe as the, song, as the hymn said at the beginning, our, my heart, Lord, is prone to wander, that we would wander back into an intimate, loving relationship with you and be able to call you friend as well as Savior. I pray this now in your holy name. Amen.